Hello, my name is Dr. Neve Hamill and I am going to talk to you today about St. Patrick, um, a very famous Irishman and one who is roundly celebrated all over the world on March the 17th. So a lot of us know about St. Patrick's Day and we've heard maybe some stories and legends about St. Patrick. Um, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about the man that we know as Patrick and explain some of the reasons why he is as well known as he is. So uh, join me now as we explore three things. First of all, was there a real Patrick? And if so, uh, what was his story? Secondly, we're going to talk about mythological Patrick, rock star celebrity Patrick. And then we'll talk a little bit about St. Patrick's Day itself and how celebrating March the 17th um, became a worldwide uh, festival and celebration. So let's begin with uh, talking about Patrick, the man that we know. And uh, we're talking about the 5th century, sometime in the 400s. And we do know that there was a man called Patrick. And we know about this because, believe it or not, he did write down some articles in his lifetime. And those articles, those letters that he wrote, survived. And most scholars agree that they are original documents that were written by Patrick. It's most unusual to have documents that are written in the 5th century that have survived this long. Um, so that's really the first thing to understand is there was a real life person called Patrick and he gave us some information about his life and about his story. Now, there are many, many more legends and stories that were written about Patrick much, much later on. Written by people who wanted to associate their churches or their parishes or their people with him. There were also people who wanted to improve the standing of Christianity in Ireland and therefore they associated the story of St. Patrick with the things that they wanted people to think. So many of the later stories are apocryphal. Um, you know, there's no evidence that any of them are true. But the fundamental story of Patrick himself and how he came to Ireland and what happened to him, uh, we do have the text for that. And so it is uh, very likely that this is what actually happened to Patrick. And it's a really interesting story. In some ways, it's much more impressive than any of the magical miracles that he was supposed to have performed uh, as a rock star saint. And um, it's also probably the story that people know least about Patrick. If we go back to sometime in the 5th century, we're talking about a young boy, a teenager, who was growing up in Roman Britain. He did write down the name of his town, but unfortunately, nobody knows where that is anymore. But that's the first thing that we have to learn, is that Patrick, the most famous person celebrated uh, in Ireland and all around the world for Irish people, was not actually Irish himself. From Roman Britain, Patrick was British. So how did he get to Ireland? Well, this too is a great story and a very unfortunate story. But back in the fifth century, it was very common for uh, pirates, groups of raiding Irish tribes to sail along the coastland of Britain and raid settlements and also to kidnap uh, young men and bring them back as slaves to Ireland. So. This happened to Patrick, his father's home, which was um, a villa, a Roman style villa in Britain, was raided by a band of pirates. And they took Patrick, who was about 16 years old at this time, and he was kidnapped with other young men and brought to Ireland, to this mad, wild landscape of uh, pagan tribes, and he became a slave. And he told us about this in a document that uh, is called the Confessio, uh, written much later in Patrick's life. But he did write about arriving to Ireland. He said he wasn't particularly religious at that time. And he was put out on the hills to work minding pigs, minding livestock, which would have been a very, very lonely occupation for a young teenager. 
and he spent six years out on the mountains, out on the hills, looking after the animals. And he writes that it was at this time that he began to feel a, a connection with God. And he used to pray, he used to get up early to pray. And it was during this experience of slavery that his conviction about Christianity was really um, increased and sharpened and honed. And he tells us then that after six years that uh, an angel appeared to him in a dream or a vision and told him that a boat was leaving and that if he made the journey across Ireland to a harbour that he would be able to make his way home. And so he made his way 200 miles across the country, got on a boat and uh, made his way slowly and after a number of adventures he made his way back home again. So. That's what we know about young Patrick. He came to a country which would have been Irish speaking or Gaelic speaking, uh, where there was little evidence of Christianity. Uh, he was lonely and um, I presume it was a terrifying experience. None of us would like to, to think about being taken away from our home at 16. And he was 22 years old then when he left Ireland. So six years a slave in Ireland. Uh, I'll just tell you where I am here now. This is St. Patrick's Well in Ballyshannon in County Donegal. And you can see here that there's a lovely statue of St. Patrick all in his bishop's outfit. And um, this is traditionally the image that we associate with St. Patrick as a bishop, very well dressed. I don't think he would have worn those garments around this kind of landscape back in the fifth century. but. This is, is the icon that we recognize as St. Patrick. But the location of this particular statue is very interesting. Right beside this Christian statue of St. Patrick, there's a tree and the tree has lots of pieces of fabric tied to it. And there's a little well here called St. Patrick's Well. And people come here all the time. They'll pay a visit to St. Patrick, but they'll also tie something onto the tree, which is not a Christian tradition, it's a pre-Christian tradition. So it's very often that we see this. We see something that's very Christian located on a site that's associated with a pre-Christian ritual. And this became very much the modus operandi of the early Christians here in Ireland. They would often build their church or mark in some way the Christian tradition right beside somewhere that was already celebrated as a place of ritual. Very, very smart to kind of appropriate the places that people already gathered to pay their spiritual debt. So by locating the Christian there, you are associating that with an already established ritual. St. Patrick returned back to his home country and became involved with the church. He became a priest. And he tells us again in his own text that he began to think about the pagan Irish, uh, those that he had left behind and he became convinced that his vocation was to return to Ireland and to be part of the conversion of these people to Christianity. Now, we often see St. Patrick dressed in his bishop robes, but in fact, he wasn't really appointed a bishop by Rome or by anybody else. And it seems that while he was considered for a missionary uh, job in Ireland that they didn't really think that he was the right person to go. He was involved in some sort of scandal, uh, something that he had confessed to a friend was revealed and it was really uh, off his own bat that he decided to go back to Ireland. So he was neither appointed by the church nor trusted with the role of converting the pagans to Ireland like we might think when we look back now. Um, Secondly, it is likely that the conversion of Ireland had started before Patrick. There were other priests um, and missionaries, notably a man called Palladius, who had gotten there before him. But one would appreciate that the fact that Patrick had already spent six years in Ireland and understood the language and understood the customs and tradition, this would make him a more effective missionary. So he did return to Ireland and another interesting thing about Patrick is he's really the first person to write and describe the people of the island as collectively Irish. He, he's really, um, his text is the first place that we see written down the Irish people or the people of Ireland. 
So he is in some way responsible for the concept of Irish nationalism. And this might also explain why he becomes such a powerful icon later on. So he returns to Ireland and he does uh, take on the work of converting pagans to Christianity. A lot of it is by negotiation, by simply talking to the chieftains, by uh, ordaining, baptizing. Um, and, and this is certainly his life's work. But again, when we read the text that he wrote towards the end of, the li of his life, he didn't seem particularly optimistic that his work would be successful. And he certainly had no idea that not only would Ireland be completely converted to Christianity, but that he would be the man most remembered for this huge transition. St. Patrick died somewhere around the late fifth century, uh, not knowing just how successful his project would ultimately be. Can't do us any harm, right? So let's talk about what happened to the story of Patrick after he died. Um, well, the process of continuing to convert Ireland from being a pagan country to a Christian country continued at quite some pace. And there were a lot of other very important saints around the time of St. Patrick and later, including St. Colum or Columba, who came from this year area here in County Donegal, and St. Bridget, who uh, came from around County Kildare. They weren't counties back then, um, but that's the area of Ireland that they were, were doing a similar, uh, similar work of conversion and building churches and um, sending other holy men and holy women out to, to spread the word. And indeed, Columba, St. Colum Kill, uh, or Colum, um, he becomes a, a very important saint in Ireland, as does St. Bridget. And from next year on, because we were good boys and girls during the COVID epidemic, our government decided to give us an extra holiday day, and that is going to be in honor of St. Bridget. So not only are we going to have a St. Patrick's Day weekend, but from next year on, we will also have a St. Bridget's Day weekend. And I will tell you the story of Bridget uh, in another lecture. But let's get back to Patrick. How did he become um, so uh, remarkable uh, a figure in Irish history slash culture slash mythology? So after his death, uh, people began to write uh, a lot more texts. I told you that Patrick began the process of writing things down, but um, in the 6th, 7th and 8th centuries, the Irish holy men in uh, particular became very literate and they created books, they created manuscripts. And of course, in those manuscripts, they wanted to tell the stories of the early missionaries. So. Patrick began to be written about and I'm sure you'll understand you know that when people die um, they, they are transferred from human beings to sort of legendary characters and all of a sudden Patrick was credited with these amazing things that happened and we have no evidence that any of them are true but if you think for example of some of the great musicians um, who have passed on or you know celebrities and suddenly uh, everybody was at their very first concert or everybody knew somebody who was at school with them and so the the kind of myth making takes off and this is what happens to Patrick and people wanted to be associated with this star power. Patrick was quite an easy person to build myths around because as I told you he was from Britain so he wasn't specifically associated with any part of Ireland and that meant that he could be associated with all parts of Ireland. So suddenly you get stories about St. Patrick being in the West and in the South and in the North and in the East. And certainly if you were to read all these stories, he would seem to have superpowers of location. You know, Patrick couldn't possibly have converted all of the Irish pagans to Christians. He couldn't have been in all of the places that he was supposed to be. 
um, and couldn't have performed all of the miracles and magic that he was supposed to have performed. But he just became the person that was most powerful, most useful to attach onto uh, your own area for promotion. He was um, like an influencer. If you named something after St. Patrick, you gave it credibility and you gave it a sense of um, authenticity. And so this happened from the seventh century onwards, you know, right up until the 19th century. People were using the stories of St. Patrick and adding to those stories and embellishing those stories in order to lend this sense of authenticity and uh, this kind of pioneering history of Christianity to whatever it is they were building themselves. In the 8th, 9th, 10th centuries, the process of church building continued, of conversion, uh, monastic settlements, education, reading, writing, scholarship. It's a time that's known as the golden age of Irish culture or the time that Ireland was called the Island of Saints and Scholars. This, this is all around this time, long after St. Patrick, but his myth is very much built into the text. So between the 7th and the 10th century, we see uh, increasing uh, development of monastic settlements, uh, a lot of missionary work, a lot of teaching, a lot of writing, a lot of manuscripts. Um, a lot of people very concerned with inserting in it the stories of the early saints, Colum Kill, Bridget, Patrick, and spreading the word, and not just around Ireland, but also to Europe. There were a lot of monastic settlements uh, built in, in the British Isles and in continental Europe by Irish saints. And so the legends and stories spread out and were written down and embellished. And by the time we get to the 12th century, we have a very powerful Christian history that includes um, many, many of the saints. Ireland suffered a number of invasions around this time. The Vikings began to invade and burn the monasteries and some of the texts. And about 200 years later, you have the Norman invasions. But believe it or not, even though these invasions happened, they didn't make a huge dent in the culture or in the landscape. Um, a lot of the Vikings and Normans actually settled here in Ireland and contributed to Irish culture. They brought, you know, positives to it as well as negatives. But in the 17th century, we have a major, major uh, intrusion into the Irish Christian world. And that, of course, is the colonization of Ireland. Um, and it follows on from the Reformation uh, in the 16th century and Henry VIII's uh, decision to name himself as the head of the Church of England, to burn down the monasteries and to clamp down on the teaching of Christianity and when the British colonize Ireland in the 17th century they bring in a set of rules about uh, outlawing really uh, Catholicism and so when they do this um, they force the people uh, out of their churches the churches are closed and they forbid the practice of Catholicism and what this does in Ireland is it makes people even more intent to find ways and means to keep their religion alive. And where I'm sitting right now is a cave, it's an old cave. But during this time in the 17th and 18th centuries when masses, indoor masses were illegal, people used to gather here um, in secret and they would have a priest say mass here in this cave. So the fact that Catholicism was driven underground, made people even more determined to uh, stay with it. And you see, when you do something like that, then it adds again to the mythology and the magical reputations of the early saints that were associated with Irish Christianity in the first place. So that helps us to understand why people tried so intently to create personalities around the story of Irish Christianity. One very interesting place that we find Patrick is where I am today which is up on the hill of Tara. 
and the hill of Tara has long been associated with um, the history, uh, the pre-written history of Ireland. Uh, up on the hill you will see a passage grave which takes us you know 5,000 years ago but it was also associated with the inauguration of the High Kings of Ireland and there is a stone up on the hill called the Leah Fall which is the inauguration stone or the ceremonial stone. So it's no surprise that when you came to these places that were highly associated as ritual sites in the past that sooner or later somebody would pop in St. Patrick here and indeed there is a story written about him that he challenges the leaders of the tribes he challenges the pagans uh, here on the hill uh, at Easter time now Again, there is no uh, evidence that any of these things happen. But in the folklore, it tells us that there was a consistent weaving in of this figure known as Patrick, uh, this catalogue of written stories that uh, enhanced his reputation and enhanced you know, the national and international reputation of the strength of Christianity. And the people who were writing at the time wanted to do that. They wanted to give an account of Irish saints. They wanted people to know how fantastic they were. They wanted to take all of the old pagan rituals that were very much valued by the people and uh, integrate them into these uh, newer Christian traditions, uh, validation by association. So I think it's important to look at this process of winning hearts and minds through the storytelling through the relocation of icons and through these uh, kind of fantastic supernatural deeds that couldn't possibly have been true but were still an important part of a folklore legacy for this man that was known as Patrick. This particular place was probably the most well-known association with St. Patrick, not just in the British Isles but all around Europe. In medieval times it became very very famous indeed as a site of penance and the story goes that St. Patrick came here in the 5th century to Loch Derg, which you can see out here behind us and he went to an island called Station Island and on it he was shown a cave and when he went into the cave he suddenly saw all of these visions very disturbing images of pain and suffering and he was told that this is what purgatory looked like and that if you were to show this to the pagans that you know this would be their final encouragement to convert to Christianity this was the fate that beheld them should they not convert to Christianity what's interesting about St. Patrick's supposed visit to purgatory was its repetition in the 12th century and there is a text written by um, a, a chap called Owen who also said that having experienced a conversion to Christianity that he brought himself here to Loch Derg and to St. Patrick's purgatory and when he visited the cave he also had these hellish terrible terrible scenes of people being strangled and eaten and being gutted by dragons and being pitchforked and set on fire and all of these terrible terrible scenarios he wrote the story down and this story was picked up by several other uh, writers in Europe and it it's one of these stories had it been on Instagram nowadays it would have gone viral so this story about this incredible place became known in Europe and it became known as the place that you could go if you had sinned and you wanted to be forgiven so thousands and thousands of people started to come here looking for this forgiveness looking for this experience this cleansing it became known as the one place that you could go uh, no matter what crime you committed no matter how heinous the crime St. Patrick's purgatory was where you might be forgiven and an interesting reference to this is in Shakespeare's Hamlet because when the ghost of his father appears and tells Hamlet that he's doomed to purgatorial duty until his murder is avenged it is St. Patrick that Hamlet swears to 
Another very interesting theory is that because of the spread of the stories of this purgatorial cave where hideous and heinous things were happening, that it might have reached the ears of one Dante, who of course wrote the Inferno and the Divine Comedy. And you know, the spectre of what purgatory looks like is quite similar in both accounts of Patrick's purgatory and then later Dante's purgatory. So we do wonder if Dante was influenced by this cult of St. Patrick. Well, welcome indoors and apologies for the noise of the wind and the rain, but it's been a very stormy week in Ireland and I had really no choice but to brave it and do the best I could because I wanted to show you at least some of the places that were associated with St. Patrick. And, you know, really, you, you can't drive three miles here without seeing a statue or a sign for a holy well or some kind of reference, a street name, um, a reference to a story. So Patrick is everywhere. And I wanted to give you a sense of that when we were out and about. However, we're indoors now and it's nice and warm. And so I just want to tell you, you know, the third element of the story, which is really how St. Patrick's Day came to be such a hugely celebrated event all around the world. We can understand why Patrick, the historical figure, is researched and the subject of scholarly study. Uh, we can also understand that he's lauded as being a famous saint and the bringer of Christianity, but there are many other saints, you know, that have wondrous stories attached to them. So how come Patrick is the one that gets a day where the whole world goes crazy, dying the river green and marching and all of that? You know, why Patrick? And of course, the answer to this question is America. It's the United States. The real idea of a St. Patrick's Day festival came out of the USA. But the reasons are cultural. Um, in the 19th century and indeed in the end of the 18th century, but particularly in the 19th century, there was mass emigration from Ireland because of colonization and specifically because of the Irish famine uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And thousands and thousands and thousands of people had to leave Ireland and seek lives uh, abroad and over a million people emigrated to the United States during this very small period of time. And because there were these new centers of migrants established, um, it was very important to celebrate uh, customs and traditions and get together and, you know, the nostalgic rituals that identified you in terms of ethnicity was important to the migrants. So this is what they did. You know, the very first St. Patrick's Day parade was held in the 1600s and you'll never guess where it was, unless you know this already. It's such a surprise. But when you think about it, where would you naturally associate with a spring party, spring break party, anybody? Yes, the first St. Patrick's Day parade was held in Florida in St. Augustine and it was an Irish missionary who decided that he would celebrate a feast day of Patrick with a, a small parade so it didn't last it's not it does not it, it's not the oldest surviving St. Patrick's Day parade that's Boston um, but I still think it's funny that the very first parade was in Florida yay and it seemed logical to associate St. Patrick with that the idea of national identity because so many of the Irish immigrants were Catholic, because they were buying into a narrative that included oppression, tr you know, the triumph of the underdog. And that seemed very well to kind of fit with the stories that they knew about St. Patrick as well. So he became a symbol, not just about religion, it, it transcended that and Patrick became a symbol for Irishness and I think a particular version of Irishness, a very uh, ancient, almost magical version of Irish that he encapsulated the history, the mythology, the magic, um, the sense of an ancient past an association both with a pious Christianity, which suited some people, and then also an association with a kind of a surreal existence as a miracle 
worker, as a superhero. You know, he's known as St. Paddy, uh, Patrick, Pat. He just, fr from everywhere, from all around Ireland, you know, again, not identified at any particular place. So he just seemed to be a very accessible symbol of Irishness that Irish people could look to and say, yeah, he's our guy. Now in Ireland, St. Patrick's Day was a religious holiday and that meant that people went to church um, on St. Patrick's Day and after mass, there would usually be some sort of local parade. The school marching band might do a parade, but it really wasn't the massive, big, crazy event um, that you, you see now. And that really came from America. First major St. Patrick's Day was in Boston. And then it was followed, of course, with the biggest parade in the world, which is in New York City. And the reason, of course, that it was championed is that it gave people an, a reason or an excuse to go out and celebrate their identity. Thousands and thousands of Irish Americans would go out and celebrate their identity. But the delivery of that celebration uh, also manifested itself with, you know, drinking alcohol and partying. Now, in some ways, you know, I kind of regret that too many people associate binge drinking of alcohol and crazy behavior with Irish culture. Um, but having said that, you know, we do that to ourselves sometimes. We're marketing Guinness and we're telling people that Ireland is great fun and the Irish pubs always usually have a sense of fun about them. So, but, you know, people began to look at the celebrations on St. Patrick's Day and say, well, that looks like fun. I think I will join in with that. And uh, over the years, it's become more and more popular and people who aren't Irish at all are very happy to go with their Irish friends or, you know, wear something green and just be Irish on the day. And that, of course, is highly flattering for, for Ireland. And we have a very, very a proactive tourist board. Tourism is a huge industry for Ireland. We need it, we depend on it. And of course, they were also able to use this popularity that was created around St. Patrick's Day. And now they organize each year that buildings all around the world are turned green for St. Patrick's Day. You know, rivers turn green. And they make sure that there are events, in, particularly in, in North America, but also in other cities around the world so it's turned into a global event uh, partly because of the huge Irish diaspora abroad and also because of very hard work by the Irish government and the Irish tourist board because it promotes Ireland and it promotes travel to Ireland and also on St Patrick's Day each year the Irish Prime Minister our Taoiseach is invited there's a standing invitation to go to the White House and present the US president with a bowl of shamrock. I don't think there's any other country with an annual date to go to the White House. That is absolutely, you know, an honor for, for Ireland and for Irish people. So we went from 16 year old Patrick, the young boy kidnapped and brought to Ireland in the fifth century through the work of the Irish missionaries and the conversion of Ireland to Christianity. Then the mythologizing of Patrick in text until he just became this national superstar. Then the identification of people with Patrick um, in the 20th century, and particularly in times of conflict and trouble, you know, it was an identifier that wasn't really perceived to be too political or too culturally ridiculous. And so we're in the run up now to a St. Patrick's Day post COVID that hopefully everybody can get out and enjoy. I'll finish up by telling you that somebody told me a story um, about being pinched if you didn't wear green on St. Patrick's Day. And again, that must have been a story that was uh, invented in the United States. I've never heard that story in all my years of, of living in Ireland. And uh, I don't like the idea of people getting pinched. Um, I think post COVID, we should all keep our hands to ourselves. But I do hope that you enjoy St. Patrick's Day now you have been uh, furnished with the information to actually know the story of St. Patrick. So go out there, enjoy it, and you can uh, insist that you tell this story to everybody you meet on that day. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.